So can I ask you to take your seats, please, so we can get started. So for those of you that don't know me, I'm Frank Verastro. I'm a senior vice president here at the center. I uh, used to run the energy program, but now I am humbled and honored to be the James Schlesinger chair here. And uh, I got to tell you, this is one of those days that you just so look forward to because the panel that we've assembled here this morning is just fantastic. Um, it spans six administrations, Democrat and Republican, House and Senate, White House, FERC. I mean, this is where the energy policy has been for the last 40 years. And even as we talk about yesterday afternoon, we had Dan Jurgen here and we were talking about exports and the studies when we look at exports. When you go back to the 1970s, we were in a situation where we had growing demand and we thought we were losing production, we were running out. And now we are in a decidedly different place, the more so on the gas side, a little less so on the oil side, still a little bit uncertain. We still have the largest nuclear fleet in the world. We have the Saudi Arabia resources of coal. We have renewables that are growing. Efficiency has become the fifth fuel. We are in a, a new place with a new reality. But in large part, we're tied to policies that were developed in the 70s for good reasons. And we need to revisit those and see how we are going forward. And now we also have the, the challenge of climate change. There's a couple of administrative items I need to go through before we get started. And the first is that you're all part of an experiment today. So typically when we do these sessions, we try to do a kind of audience and speakers. And we really wanted this to be participatory because I got to tell you, I'm not sure when we get a group like this back again. Uh, and we want to avail ourselves of that opportunity. And there's folks in the audience that I want to draw into this conversation, so don't be surprised if you get called on. But as a result of that, um, we have this open square. I will apologize to folks that are watching on webcast. This is not the ideal situation. We do this typically when we have the oil market study group or the gas market study group. It's a smaller 25 to 40 person group. We've never done it this large before. So we'll see how that goes. Second administrative note is that um, you'll notice from the invite, we had a much larger panel. Um, we lost two in the last 24 hours. So Heather Zeichel, who is now an affiliate with us at CSIS, she was deputy assistant to the president. Um, she worked on climate and energy issues. Uh, Senator Biden gave her a phone call and invited her to an event. She was trying to deconflict, but that was kind of an easy choice. So he gave her a pass on that. And Rebecca Rosen, who, I'm sorry? We call him Vice President. Vice President Biden. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, I'm going to hear from that one. Um, thank you very much. We call him Vice President. So Rebecca Rosen was also supposed to join us. Rebecca is uh, Vice President for Devon now, but she was the lead energy analyst uh, and advisor on the Romney campaign. She texted me last night at 1030 and thought she was going into labor. So her doctor has advised her to stay home. Um, which I think is probably, you know, we have a lot of excitement at this place, but that's probably one thing we don't need at this point, and she doesn't need, so that would be just a wise decision. But having said that, we still can make up with this panel the discussion that we need to cover this topic. You have in your uh, materials uh, extended bios on all these speakers, um, so I won't go into that. I, I would want to say, and I'm just so appreciative, Senator and Charlie and Linda, Kevin, Joe, for you joining us. I would urge you to, to um, participate and pose questions and raise issues. Um, we're going to do this in kind of a question answer format that we can engage folks. Um, we don't want it to be one sided. I will I'll give everybody on the panel the opportunity to say what they want to say if we don't draw it out in a question. I'm smart enough to do that. Uh, Senator Bennett Johnson, as you know, uh, worked on the Senate for many, many years, was chairman of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, senator from Louisiana, uh, has a wide berth of experience on a lot of the legislation that was done in the 80s and 90s and was around in the 1970s. Charlie Curtis, I first met when he was at FERC and I was at DOE. I was just a child at the time. Um, Charlie was chairman of FERC. He was the deputy secretary and undersecretary of energy. Uh, he was the founding partner of Van S. Fellman um, and a longtime friend. Linda Stunts I have known forever from when she was counsel on the House side. She also ran the policy office at DOE and was Deputy Secretary of Energy. Um, she was also an advisor to the Romney campaign. 
Joe Aldi, I actually knew uh, by reputation, but didn't know well until 2009. So we worked together on the Obama campaign. And one day early in 2009, he called me up and he said, we need to do a download on information because there was this rumor that I was going to the NSC. And so we had lunch together. It was an exciting lunch. Uh, but in fact, we never made the, the handoff <laughs> for a variety of reasons. Joe is now at Harvard, but he was a special assistant to the president. He did energy and climate change uh, at the National Economic Council. Um, he's a fellow at, at RFF, and we're also trying to bring him on board here at CSIS. Kevin Kolovar is runs the Washington office for Dow. Uh, he's the vice president for Dow. But Kevin was an assistant secretary at the Department of Energy. So we've spanned between Deputy Secretaries, Assistant Secretary, White House, Senate, House, FERC. This is the group that you need to discuss these issues with. So thank you all for coming and thank you all for participating. And we'll try this grand experiment and see how it goes. My lead off question is, is to this side of the table. So I'm going to draw back to the 70s before I go forward. We, we call this kind of, it was, should be looking back, looking forward, looking forward, looking back however you want to look at it. But in terms of perspective, it's really important to see how we got here and where we're going from this point on. So what I'd like to do is to start with, with Linda Charlie and Senator, I'll let you go first. But this whole notion of where we are now, of all the things that you've seen over the last 35 years, is this uh, uh, the newest iteration on a constantly changing landscape, or is this a new defining moment? Where are we in terms of the new energy reality that we're facing? Well, I, I guess since I'm the oldest person in this room, maybe I ought to start out uh, by saying that it's, uh, it's both new and different and, and, and the same old, same old. It's the same old, same old in the sense that back in our day, we had very, very controversial issues. Sitting next to Charlie Curtis, who was uh, uh, Chief Counsel to Energy and Commerce when we had the Natural Gas Policy Act. Now, many of you are not old enough to remember how controversial that was. I mean, that was almost as controversial as Obamacare. I mean, it was, uh, would, and, and the House had a, a bill that they had passed, which was regulation forever, and the Senate had deregulation and we had to come together in a conference committee and work it out. Now, in those days, we could, and after some 12 months in a conference committee, we found common ground, and it was common ground that worked, perhaps the most successful bill I've ever had anything to do with, because it deregulated gas, increased supply, and the price went down. Now, when I look at the situation today, it is highly controversial, global warming. I mean, you've, got, you've got the deniers on one side, and you've got the, uh, I'd call the regulators, those who really think that by 2050 you can be 83% uh, free of greenhouse gases. Uh, I mean, the gap between those two is so great that it challenges their grasp of reality. Um, I think we're in a brand new paradigm as far as energy is concerned. Natural gas is surely uh, as good as they say, probably better. Uh, and when I talk about uh, uh, energy, I, I do so from a perspective of a lot of humility because I've seen in 40 years of, of watching energy that there are surprises that come that nobody predicted such a shale gas that changes the paradigm. That said, I think it is clearly true that natural gas and shale oil have changed the paradigm, give this country a chance to uh, take off uh, industrially and, uh, and, and have a period of uh, prosperity such that we haven't had in a long time provided that the regulators, those who want to do away with uh, fracking altogether as opposed to just regulating it, and those who want to make it difficult uh, to extract this kind of energy or burn this kind of energy, 
uh, it, it is going to be a, a great conflict that's going to uh, uh, transpire between now and the next few years. Uh, when you look at the gap, I mentioned 83 percent. The United States has actually signed on to the uh, United Nations protocol that uh, uh, puts us uh, on a goal to uh, reduce greenhouse gases by 83 percent by 2050. Now, being one who accepts the, uh, the uh, diagnosis of uh, global warming, I mean, I think you've got to be sort of anti-science if you don't accept that diagnosis. But the cure, if that is the cure, 83 percent off of greenhouse gases, is totally uh, unattainable and is simply not going to happen. And if you think it might happen, look at the Energy Information Administration predictions of what uh, the future holds in energy. They predict, uh, for example, uh, that the GDP of the world will triple, that uh, greenhouse gases will increase by 56 percent by 2040, that uh, uh, use of coal will go up and not down, and when we look at that gap, I long for those days uh, when Charlie Curtis was there and could find a way through this muddle. It's, uh, it's not going to be easy to find uh, a, a real solution to these problems. But suffice it to say, the outlook has never been brighter in terms of uh, what we might do if we manage it correctly and is uh, somewhat frightening if we do not. Thanks, sir. Charlie? When Frank uh, first uh, conceived of this program, it sounded Dixonian, uh, like a Christmas carol, uh, the ghost of Christmas past and Christmas present. Christmas. So I'm the ghost of Christmas past, I think, because I, I started, uh, I was a treasury in the SEC, and I went to the Hill in 71 to work on rewriting the securities laws, Yom Kippur war hit in 73 and the world changed. Uh, and prices of oil uh, quadrupled in the world market and uh, in the U.S. Um, double digit inflation, double digit unemployment, and uh, the a term was introduced into our lexicon of stagflation. Uh, so we had a stagnant economy and inflation at the same time. It was a hell of a strain on the political system. Uh, in the Yom Kippur War, uh, that provoked a, uh, a public response, which took the form of legislation. And the most important component at the time was to address what was in place as the remnants of the Economic Stabilization Act, which for those who are students of history know that uh, under the Nixon administration, there had been in effect a wage and price freeze that was throughout the economy. And there were remaining in effect uh, uh, price controls on oil and petroleum product, beef and health services. So the Congress's decision was whether to allow price controls to expire on oil in the face of quadrupling of the world oil price. That was a much harder political decision given the economic profile that I just outlined. So oil was under price controls which contributed significantly to a growing and increasing demand for oil uh, in the uh, late 60s and early 70s because oil was cheap and its use was inefficient in both industry, commercial, and residential 
context. Uh, and gasoline was probably the signature cheap fuel of the day. Uh, natural gas, I mean, uh, gasoline was, as I recall, cheaper than water in those days and uh, on a gallon basis. Uh, so it not surprisingly put a tremendous de demand burden on supply. Interestingly enough as well, natural gas had never been purposefully by legislative or executive decision regulated to price. It resulted from a Supreme Court case that interpreted the Natural Gas Act of 1938 as applying to wellhead sales for resale in interstate commerce. So again, the Congress was faced with removing price controls in a circumstance where uh, that would involve enormous wealth transfers from the northern part uh, tier of the United States where natural gas was used for space heating and to the southern tier of the United States where natural gas was produced and uh, transmitted. And those were tremendously difficult political challenges to our political system. Uh, we developed something called energy policy in the 70s. Nobody knew what energy policy was in 1973. Most of the policies were reflected in acts that were written in the 30s. Federal Power Act of 35, the Natural Gas Act of 38, uh, the uh, regulation of interstate oil pipelines also in the 30s. Uh, they were one-off policies that were not enacted with any sort of cohesive whole in mind. The Environmental Protection Agency was wholly independent from any other as aspect of the U.S. government and offshore uh, leasing policy was administered by the Department of Interior with uh, independent uh, policy judgments being made, again, without any relationship to other uh, uh, policies that uh, were emerging in the 70s. So the first thing uh, I, I wanted to point out is the energy policy that was first enunciated uh, was a derivative policy deriving from our overarching economic, national security, and environmental goals. As such, it, those, as we would recognize, are often in conflict, and as such, energy policy was itself uh, difficult to represent in any coherent form or comprehensive form. Uh, yet it was attempted uh, by Jim Schlesinger in uh, the uh, April of uh, 1977 with, and I brought along the National Energy Plan. And there's a lot of interesting things in that because the basic decision at that time is we're running out of oil and gas. We had to basically shift demand off of oil and gas, develop renewables, synthetic fuels, and switch more of our electricity production onto nuclear and coal. Um, uh, global warming was not a concept, or climate change was not a concept that entered into policy in the 1970s. So as we look where we are today, we had uh, a Congress in the 70s that was divided between those who said, just do it, and those who said, do this. So there were the, those who approached the energy crisis or problems that confronted the nation as letting the markets function efficiently and effectively to produce outcomes in the best interest, economic interest of the country, or regulatory uh, structures that would produce policy outcomes that were dictated by those regulatory structures. I think over time what's changed, and I think this is fundamental change, is that the reliance on markets I think is now deeply ingrained in our political psyche. 
uh, I think the, um, and this is going to play out in whether we're going to let markets, uh, I think, principles function in the decisions on uh, whether to permit the export of oil into the global market uh, and whether to permit uh, exports or increasing exports of uh, natural gas into the global market. Um, the, that, those two decisions are not laydowns, but my personal belief is that the principle of, of relying on market outcomes as opposed to regulatory structures will prevail in, uh, in those contexts. We have now, we did succeed in deregulating the price of oil, largely through a mechanism started in, in uh, 75, the uh, Energy Production and Conservation Act, and as Bennett suggested, the Natural Gas Policy Act of 78. Both very significant, given the financial uh, stakes involved and the corresponding emotions involved, that was a tremendous proudful accomplishment, I think, of our democratic system. And uh, I credit Bennett Johnson's leadership very, very much for uh, allowing that result to happen. So now we're in a situation where uh, we seem to embrace the efficiency and outcome of markets rather than regulatory requirements, uh, having an experience range that has kind of demonstrated the better outcomes that they produce and the efficiencies that they uh, um, manage to accomplish. And we are, in our wrestles, instead of switching, uh, as we were in the 70s, onto more nuclear and more coal, we seem to be switching off of nuclear and off of coal and evolving a market that may be more single fuel dependent on natural gas. Uh, the nuclear resource in this country is severely strained in its uh, ability to continue operating under existing licenses because uh, the uh, natural gas prices and supply are just on an economic dispatch basis are, are killing nuclear pricing. And uh, coal, of course, is uh, the, as, as a dominant uh, source of greenhouse gas carbon dioxide, uh, is under severe stress by uh, the Environmental Protection Agency and 111D and any other manifestation of action taken to address global climate change. Uh, the, uh, th those are fundamental differences uh, that I think are at play. The reliance on market outcomes, except in the case of environmental regulation. And in environmental regulation, that is biasing toward a single fuel dependence on natural gas in electricity production and a uh, increasing um, burden on existing coal and nuclear investments. And whether those, and what the implications of that over time might be uh, will be the great challenge of the present and the future. Thank you. Great job. Brenda. Thank you, Frank. Thank you for having me. It's a great honor, and it's terrific to see so many familiar faces around the room. Um, as I have through much of my career, in answering your question, Frank, I benefit from, uh, from what these gentlemen to my left have, have said already. So It's not a political statement. With humility. Of course not. Of course not. Um, with the humility that Bennett talked about, having, having been part of, uh, you know, having seen Congress pass legislation in 1981 that forbade the burning of natural gas to, to generate electricity because it was thought that we were running out, having worked on legislation involving the Synthetic Fuels Corporation, 
which, which uh, manifested itself in a, a lot of taxpayer dollars spent to gasify coal in North Dakota. Um, I do think, and I look particularly at the young people in this room, I do think that things have changed for this country in a very important and fundamental way. We have gone from, from a situation of scarcity and a mentality of scarcity and policies to deal with scarcity to, to an abundance that I don't think was imagined or imaginable not that long ago. Uh, I saw an analyst last week who said that the combined oil and gas market in U.S. and Canada is experiencing the biggest change in a century because of shale oil and gas. And I thought, well, that's kind of a... And then when you think about it, it is both Canada and the U.S., and it's important to think about both together because although we focus on things like Eagleford and Bakken and uh, Utica in the U.S., there, there are shale resources in Canada which haven't even been tapped or talked about a lot yet because transportation and demand and so forth. But you think about that together and what that means, it is changing everything here. It is affecting refining. Is it affecting alternative fuels, ethanol? It is affecting greenhouse gas emissions. May I remind you, putting aside the current, current issues on the proposed rule, EIA's base case, looking out 40 years, does not have U.S. greenhouse gas emissions returning to 2005 levels. That's, that's not including the rule. I mean, that's pretty phenomenal when you think about it, and you think about whether any other country in the world can be there, I wonder. Uh, it's affecting manufacturing, and I know Kevin will speak to this. We're having a rebirth of manufacturing that I think was, again, unimagined as we lost jobs and manufacturing capability abroad. It's because of low price inputs. Uh, again, just a factoid, because I like these things. Eagleford itself, by 2020, could produce two million barrels of oil a day, which is about what the North Slope produced at its peak, when you think about that. That is what we are dealing with, and in my career, we haven't had something like that. And I do think uh, those who, who follow and hopefully come, come to these forums and learn, it's going to be up to you uh, in, in what is a more, much more difficult political environment to figure out how do we deal with that in an environmentally responsible way. And I say that because to me, it is only in, a, in an abundance that really enables you to look at sustainability as hard as we are looking at it and perhaps as appropriately as we are looking at it. When, when we are dealing with stagflation and the kinds of things that Charlie talked about in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, it, even into, into the 80s where we thought we were running out of natural gas and we thought we were running out of oil, you know, those concerns, and you can see it a, a play out around the world if you go to India or China, when, when there is an issue of adequacy, when you are denuding hills because you don't have energy, it is very difficult to implement and talk about sustainable environmental policy. These are linked. So I think we have opportunities now to do things not only in an energy standpoint, but to link sustainability in, in a new way. And so, but as, uh, again, as Bennett said, that, that could be squandered. That can be squandered with inappropriate regulatory policies and finding the right balance, looking forward in an era of abundance, uh, I think is going to be a great challenge. And, and so I do think there's a big change, Ben. Can I ask you to turn off your microphones and then we'll run them back this way? Okay, great. So not surprisingly, uh, this is a great segue. I'm going to turn to this side of the table, and it's not age division here. Um, but for Joe and Kevin, so when you look at this, if, if you came out of the 60s and 70s when a lot of this energy policy was formulated, it was on the basis of resource scarcity and growing demand, and now we've flipped it. So the question I would pose for you all is, is it, part of it's generational, clearly, but are you encumbered by the policies of the past, or do you look at this in a whole new light, taking what we've learned from the past and the assumptions that were made? Um, and one of the things that, and Charlie reminds me of this all the time, but, but some of the assumptions that were conventional wisdom, you know, in the 1970s and 80s turned out to be wrong. And so as we go forward, we need to be mindful of the fact that this snapshot, uh, we should enjoy the moment, but we shouldn't get stuck in the moment and figure out where you need to be. So where would you take this next? I mean, so when you, when you formulate um, policies for the, the next administration or, or to campaigns coming up or companies doing investing now, what does that look like given the reality of today? Kevin, let me start with you and I'll work our way back. <clears throat> Thanks, Frank. Um, appreciate uh, the chance to be here and, and seeing everybody. 
You know, I think as we, I, I appreciate all the points that were made before. I don't disagree with them. I think my sense of it would be to focus on the fact that um, um, it's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So we should be looking, we think we need to get away from um, a view of, hey, we were uh, setting policies based on scarcity, and now we should set them based on abundance. We were wrong on scarcity, right? Dramatically wrong. We have uh, import facilities that dot the East Coast that, that do no business because we were wrong. And we can come up with other examples. So I think the sense that we have is um, we, see, we see abundance in, in several areas, certainly in the shale oil um, area, shale gas, um, in associated liquids. Um, but that doesn't mean that we, we bet the farm on one policy approach. And so, so as we look at this right now, it's our sense that this is the most appropriate time for the Congress and the administration to be looking at comprehensive energy policy. And of course, that's not happening in Congress today. And, and as a result, the administration is moving forward unilaterally, and they're doing it through uh, regulatory mechanisms. And frankly, who can blame them? Right? They came in, this administration came in with stated policy objectives. They're pursuing their, uh, those policy objectives. And, and, and frankly, they're doing it in a vacuum because there is not any kind of corresponding view from Capitol Hill. Now, we see rifle shot bits of legislation that come out um, that seek to address, you know, a, a pipeline issue or a permitting issue or, or something. But frankly, we should kind of be embarrassed. So for the last three years, two years really, we've had a fairly vitriolic fight over the LNG export permitting process. At the end of the day, there's very little substantive difference between, um, between where some of the chemical players are and where the producers are, right? It's a matter of degree as opposed to, you know, one end of the spectrum being don't frack at all, right? Natural gas is bad too, let's just leave it in the ground. But, but realistically, I mean, if we just take, for example, the 2005 uh, Energy Policy Act, right? 18 or an inch and a half, right, of, of, uh, of uh, statute that took four years to develop. I mean, this LNG export discussion would not take half a page in that provision of law. And, and certainly we can point back to other provisions of law before that. So we have shale abundance, at least in the near term, I'm happy to get into this if anybody has questions. Dow has some concerns about midterm um, abundance just because of all the demands that are coming online from export, from carbon regulations. And we probably have long-term abundance. We certainly have near mid and long-term abundance in shale oil. We have coal, the capacity to, to, uh, to burn coal for safe, reliable electricity in a much cleaner fashion than we've ever had. We have new nuclear designs on the plans that no one really expects will ever be uh, put uh, into the ground. Um, and on the renewable side, and, and Dow's a big player on the renewable side, um, we, have, we have a curve, an efficiency curve on um, solar cells that are starting to mirror the uh, processor speed um, increases that we were seeing in the 90s and 2000, right? That they're starting to double every 18 months. And there, there are some pretty astonishing, if you consider that that could happen for the next 10 years, there's some pretty astonishing changes that, that take place in the country. So we, we could walk through all of these, but fundamentally we look at this and say, this is really the time when we should be considering all of these issues in one comprehensive fashion. Everyone in this room understands how hard that's going to be to do with the current challenges we have in Congress, but energy legislation will never ripen if it's never introduced in the first place. And so um, we would like to see that happen. Perhaps uh, that, could be, um, that could be part of the platforms of one or both of the campaigns that we start to swing into action post-November, um, and we'd be big fans of seeing that. Uh, first, Frank, uh, thanks for hosting this, uh, this event. Uh, this is a lot of fun. I, uh, I think uh, your question on should past policies encumber policies going forward, l let, me, let me change that into a positive question, which is do the past policies right. encumber going forward? And, and I think they ha the past policies have uh, impacts along two really important dimensions. One 
just given the, the long lifetimes of most energy capital, the investment decisions that people have made in the past, reflecting the past policy frameworks, are going to have an impact Excellent. going forward. And, and so I think that's important when we think about what kind of potential changes to policies might have to those who have made those, those investments and had uh, expectations on returns on those investments when they made them. And I think the second uh, important dimension is the fact that uh, we are implementing energy policy with old laws today um, because we aren't able to get uh, a comprehensive energy bill uh, or even a serious debate of a, a comprehensive energy bill in Congress. We're seeing the use of, of old laws, uh, in some cases uh, applying laws for purposes that probably were not uh, considered uh, when Congress first passed them. And, and probably a, a prime example of that is, is thinking about how to use the Clean Air Act to address greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you know, I, when I think about sort of energy policy going forward, you know, I, I tend to think about sort of the three primary objectives that I think almost anybody, regardless of political affiliation, has when it comes to energy policy, which is we like to have our energy cheap, we like to have it reliable and accessible, and we like to have it clean. Now, it's important, and I think the distinctions across parties and across regions depends on how we define some of those terms, right? So I would say in, in the Obama administration, clean, a very big, important component of clean is dealing with climate change, uh, whereas I would have said the previous administration, the Bush administration, clean was much more getting fine particulates uh, out, of, uh, out of energy, and there was more focus uh, on, on that dimension. Uh, but I think the thing is, is that in, in general, everyone says we should have these three they're going to define them a little differently. They're going to apply sort of different weights. Uh, but I think the uh, fundamental change in the energy system in America over the past uh, decade or so allows us to place less weight on accessible energy because we are no longer reliant as much on being able to bring in energy. The fact that we are uh, self-sufficient on gas, the fact that we've seen since 2005 a halving of our net imports of petroleum. Uh, when we see forecasts of, of the U.S. Uh, eventually becoming uh, the largest producer of oil in the world and, and debates on whether or not the U.S. could become self-sufficient in, in, in liquids, it, it allows one to put a little bit less weight on, I think, the accessibility dimension and allows one to focus on those dimensions where there's been less uh, attention. And I think that's one reason why you see in the Obama administration more focus now on trying to take on uh, the challenge of climate change. Um, you know, I think back to some of the, uh, the modeling analyses and economic analyses in the 1990s in the debate about climate change policy. And if you sort of got into the weeds of the models, you learned that basically one uh, uh, factor in these models dominated everything else, and that was the supply of natural gas. If you thought you could supply a lot of natural gas cheaply, you would find that reductions in, in CO2 emissions in the U.S. energy system would be pretty cheap. You saw some people say the estimated cost of Kyoto back in the 1990s would be relatively low. There were others who said, we just don't have the gas, and that's going to put an incredible burden on coal. And as a result, uh, we're going to see really, really high costs associated with complying with something like, uh, like Kyoto. I think when you look at the world today, with the dramatic increase in natural gas that we have in the U.S., I mean, we've seen coal share decline by about a fifth in the power sector. And that's not because of EPA regulations. Now, there are EPA regulations on a number of fronts coming down the road, but that's because of natural gas pushing that out. We've also seen some push in renewables. Uh, uh, as a function of both of state policies and I think of some of the, the um, federal support, especially in the Recovery Act. But of course, the game changer there was cheap natural gas. And that allows one to then think, how can we push further, I think, on the climate dimension going forward, at least over the interim? Not, not looking out to what is admittedly, uh, as the Senator noted, a very ambitious goal for 2050, but how do you think about the policy going forward over the next decade uh, or two? And I think that's important because as we think about energy policy, a lot of times when we've uh, considered energy policy in the U.S. has been very much focused on the domestic scene. And I think we have a growing appreciation now for the international dimensions when we think about climate, certainly more so now that we think we might become an exporter of crude, uh, and certainly a, on the issue associated with, with natural gas and, and, and LNG exports. So I, I think there's a growing need for us to think uh, about um, uh, the uh, international dimensions uh, of our energy policy. It's certainly an issue that comes up more and more in our uh, bilateral talks and some of our trade talks. And certainly it's important in the climate dimension when we think about going forward and not just here's what we're doing to reduce emissions. Here's the commitment we've made and here are the actions that we have in law and in regulation to implement those. Hopefully that then starts to leverage actions and efforts in other countries so that you get this kind of multipliers, not just here the cost of, of what the U.S. is undertaking to reduce our emissions of CO2, 
and here are the reductions in CO2 we may see in the power sector, but also here's how we're able to secure a more robust uh, and, a, and a deeper uh, agreement in terms of, of emission reductions from Europe, uh, Japan, but most, more importantly, from the large emerging economies where we see and forecast the large growth in emissions. So I think, I think going forward, um, there, there, there's certainly going to be a need for change to reflect, I think, the changing uh, uh, energy system dynamic. Uh, I think that should reflect then how we place our weights on these objectives that I think in general people share, at least at the abstract level, but it's important to also take into account uh, what our role in energy policy should be vis-a-vis -vis other countries in the world. Uh, I'd be interested, uh, my colleagues on my right and left, of, as I have participated in comprehensive energy legislation or attempts thereof, and I suspect we share a distinct lack of affection for that type of activity. And so I'd, my question is uh, whether an attempt at comprehensive legislation um, would simply by undertaking it um, in the political environment within which we now live, uh, where Bennett Johnsons of the world do not exist in our, uh, certainly in, in uh, double digits in our Senate or our House, uh, do we think that we could really articulate something that would be better than uh, what exists today, and, and whether that something would in fact reconcile the executive and the Congress in a uh, unified policy. Uh, it's hard to imagine it being accomplished in anything less than two Congresses, and uh, in the interim that will uh, potentially freeze investment in de-bottlenecking the infrastructure uh, on, that is, uh, has implications for both oil and gas production in the United States and a lot of other uh, investment and economic activity. So I, I, I'd like to turn the question back to uh, the last, last two speakers, Joe, and uh, that, that uh, what do you really think would be accomplished by comprehensive legislation if it were attempted? Well, and, let me just put it a, be? A, the finer point on that, because there's a little bit of mind melt going on, not surprisingly. Um, so this whole notion, if you were to if you were formulate a policy back in 2000, well, go back to 2006. So we came off peak oil, right? So whatever candidate was running in 2007, oil went to $35, 2008. It was, uh, no, 2007, it was 35, or 2006, 2007, $65 a barrel. By 2008, that summer before the convention, it was 140, right? And moving north, the notion that we were clearly running out, um, uh, new technologies needed to buy on the floor, push uh, resource development and research, um, promote climate change, because you had Copenhagen coming up. The world so dramatically changed just between 2008 and 2010, right? I, so to Charlie's point, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering with the amount of change that has occurred just in the last five years, that had we decided to uh, move away from the policies of the past wholesale and try to put in place a new policy based on a snapshot, how long-lived that policy would have been just because the, the technology and the price. And on the natural gas piece, it just strikes me that, you know, everyone talks about frack, we've been fracking for 60 years, right? And horizontal drilling, the extended length and the amount of the fracks has changed, but it was $12 gas price that kicked this off and access to private lands where you could lease that acreage. I think the oil story is a little bit different in the fact that now we can get into multiple horizons at the same time, right? Um, but they're not uniform. The shale gas is source rock, so we've got a lot of it. Um, thousands of trillion cubic feet, which from an industry perspective is like, this is infinity, this is 8,000 trillion cubic feet. So close. When you start looking at the geopolitical ramifications, and Bob's joined us from the State Department, Bob Sakuda, there's this notion of how energy used to be viewed as a liability, and now it's an asset. 
And then some people would even take it a step further that should we use it as leverage as opposed to the free market system and the United States being a reliable supplier to bring incremental barrels or MCFs of gas to the world. It's, it's a difficult time, and then when you add climate and economics around this, it's a difficult time to try to put comprehensive legislation. So I, I would echo Charlie's comments and, and look for um, advice, guidance, insight from anyone. And we'll start that way and work on down. Um, look, I don't disagree that it's incredibly hard. I, I think the challenges, the, the legislative challenges, um, are obvious to anybody that's been paying attention to the way Washington works or doesn't work lately. Um, but that can't be an excuse to do nothing. I, you know, to, to hit a couple of the specific points, with respect to infrastructure today and, and um, infrastructure inadequacy and aging infrastructure are some of the biggest impediments to increased efficiency, whether it's, you know, product flow um, uh, or electricity usage and the like. I do agree with some of the earlier comments that, that the, the market is penetrated um, to an extent where I don't think that a debate in Congress today about comprehensive energy legislation would disincentivize companies from going out and looking to, to invest in debottlenecking. I think the market is going to incentivize companies to go out there and put new pipelines on the ground in particular. That's what we're seeing. On the electricity side, to the, ex to the extent that there's a disincentive, it's a patchwork of laws that are on the books today um, that make exceptionally difficult cross-state transmission line of any significant size. So that, to me, is an ongoing impediment to uh, infrastructure development and debottlenecking. Um, and, um, you know, I think the third point I would make on that is Everybody understands, right, we've talked about it, Linda mentioned it in particular, that we have this new paradigm. We should be thinking about um, and energy surpluses going forward and how do we utilize that. And I think the question we need to ask ourselves is, should we look at that in kind of rifle shot bits of legislation or regulation or not at all? Um, or, or to the extent that people say we should be moving away from this scarcity mentality into another mentality, how do you do that? Well, I think the way you do that is you get you, you get the major policy leaders in the country to start discussing it and, and seeing where those lines of agreement can be. And then the last point I would make on this is, is while it is less true than it was in the 1990s and a decade ago, it is still the case that, um, uh, that energy positions break very often um, along regional lines uh, and not political lines. And so, so this is the optimist to me, but perhaps this is an issue where we can come over, we can overcome partisan divides and find common ground uh, because of the views that are brought by different regions, producing regions, consuming regions of the country. So Charlie, while you worked on energy bills that actually passed, I got to work on one that <laughs> did not. Um, so so I, I recognize that it is, it is very hard. I, I, I think it is, uh, I think energy policy feels to me more partisan um, than it did perhaps when I was naively an outsider to the process uh, before, or maybe I was just optimistic when you see an energy bill pass in 05 and 07, you think, oh, we'll pass one in 09. Um, but it, 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 there are really important uh, regional differences, as, as, as Kevin noted. Uh, you know, I, I think part of it is that you know, for us to finally see action, people have to realize that um, you know, staying in their trenches and fighting for the status quo eventually will be untenable. And, uh, you know, we could say, look, we have a Clean Air Act. It's not ideal for dealing with climate change. There's a better way to go. There's a way to go that'll be more cost effective, better for the environment, better for investment incentives, better for innovation. Um, didn't happen with Congress. It, made it, it became very clear it was not going to happen with Congress, and so the president is using his existing authorities. Uh, you know, after the oil spill of 2010, um, we realized that uh, the OCS Lands Act and the Oil Pollution Act would probably be reformed to make us more effective in how we manage uh, uh, offshore drilling and ensure the safety uh, of offshore drilling. Um, again, a bill didn't pass. Uh, Interior had some authorities uh, where they could do some things. Um, yeah, at the end of the day, it would have been better to have a, a new law that actually would, uh, for example, enshrine the, the new um, uh, division of effort among the divisions uh, uh, or the new uh, offices within 
uh, interior to address some of the questions about um, safety rules, address, address some of the questions about uh, liability for spills, et cetera. I think it would have been better to, to have had that. Um, we didn't get that. I, I agree, Charlie. I, I think you're even optimistic to say just the next two Congresses. It, it's not obvious to me when things will change, but I think eventually what we will realize is that if you continue to use laws that were written uh, uh, some several decades ago to apply to the challenges we face today, I think at some point people will realize there's got to be a better way forward. And I, and I just don't know how long it sort of takes um, the body politic to get there. Um, you know, I would have thought if, if this event were held in, say, so, you know, spring 2008, we knew the two major party presidential candidates, I would have been quite confident that there would be cap and trade legislation to deal with climate change because the two candidates had virtually identical positions. Um, and uh, as it turned out, of course, uh, uh, the bill um, uh, never moved in the Senate. So I, I, I think. What we've learned is, is, is not only can things change dramatically in the, in the energy system, but things can change quite dramatically in the political system. Um, so I think it's a challenge to assess what's the likelihood in the near term of, of moving legislation. And so, you know, it, it's, uh, you, you then end up in a situation where you use the, the existing authorities. And, um, you know, hopefully, I, I'd like to see a, a more thoughtful energy policy going forward. So hopefully at some point people realize the status quo isn't worth protecting. Um, on, on all sides of the issues, and instead there, there's some thoughtful compromise that actually makes energy policy work better um, and promotes uh, the achievement of the objectives that I think, at least at, at the general level, we all share. Well, I think it's out of the question that we would pass a comprehensive energy legislation in this Congress, in either this Congress or the next Congress, or for the foreseeable future. That said, I think it is more important than ever that we begin the debate and that we try to get an informed public and an informed Congress. And I think uh, not to uh, butter up to uh, the think tanks in, in this room, but it is the era of the think tank because we need the wisdom that comes out of the studies you do here at CSIS, for example, uh, Frank has done a lot of work on uh, crude oil exports. Now, it is very important to have these studies that tell us whether the price of gasoline goes up, or the price of worldwide crude goes up, or the price of domestic crude goes up. These are very, very important questions that you can't really solve with uh, uninstructed members on the floor of the Senate uh, just uh, getting their wisdom from backyard barbecues. You need this from people who really know. The same thing is true of natural gas exports and the, the kind of studies. And, and what you can do can inform those uh, in the Congress. Nuclear. Uh, you know, it, 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 we need a very important debate on nuclear. And the question there is going to be cost. And you need a lot of these economists that can tell us uh, what the eventual cost there will be. Uh, we need to uh, look at things like corn ethanol. Now, the, how did that get past you think tanks <laughs> and get into policy? Uh, uh, we need to, you know, one of the things that needs to be really studied is the cost of renewables. I was on a panel not too long ago with a, uh, with a uh, uh, great uh, physicist who said that nobody knows what the cost of renewables are because there are all these unknown factors. You know, you've got, you, you've got the federal law and the state law and the uh, uh, tax uh, uh, provisions and the cost of transmission and all of that. And that, we need to, to know that as, because if we're going to base our energy policy, which to a large extent it is today based upon renewables, then you need somehow to know what they cost. And nobody really does know. I mean, I just saw a, a PhD study from uh, Texas Tech that said that the cost of uh, wind is 50% more than has been projected by EIA. You know, that's just one study. We need 
a lot of attention to that kind of question. Transmission is, is just huge. It's probably, uh, in, in order to, to capture, uh, you know, the high plains wind, you've got to have a whole new transmission system and it's got to be paid for in a different way. The, the old way of having the, uh, the, uh, the generator and the user pay probably can't work for a nationwide system. You have to socialize that cost. That, that's a huge debate that needs to be done, uh, not only in the Congress, but among policymakers. Uh, I could go on and on, but this debate needs to start. These are incredibly uh, important questions about which there is, in some areas, very little knowledge, in other areas, uh, wrong knowledge. And uh, uh, it, it, if you're going to have a real debate, and if you're going to have a real change in energy policy, it, it ought to be based upon an informed judgment, which at this point, it is not. When I came to CSIS just recently, because I've been off doing national security issues uh, for the last 10 years, and, uh, I was informed that this is a think tank, not an answer tank. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I, I would echo Bennett's, uh, we need to find a way of developing a better shared education of the public and the public's representatives in the Congress about some of uh, the fundamentally uh, determinative issues in our energy future. Uh, whether that gets, feeds into uh, some sort of legislative address, I would reserve judgment on. But it will be, it would be, uh, I, I would say, extraordinarily useful to have that educational process provide context to uh, allow the individual rifle shot policies that will emanate out of an executive, whatever the outcome of the next election, or the Congress, uh, be, be as well informed as it could. So I think your point is very well taken. Yeah, I, I would suggest we deflect away from legislation, comprehensive or otherwise. I mean, one of the things I've learned over the years of successful and unsuccessful legislation, you have to have <clears throat> at least some level of consensus on the problem and some level of consensus on the solution. And one of the things that scarcity does or did is it brought people together in a common purpose to say, oh my gosh, we're running out. We have to develop things to address this supply problem. <clears throat> and frankly, one of the consequences of the shift is, well, well, we have an abundance. What does that mean? Is that a problem? No. So what do I need to do about that? Now, let's, you know, the elephant in the room here is climate change. And, and most of what I heard Joe talk about is reforming the Clean Air Act to deal with climate change. And I, I'm, I'm not going to go there, but I would suggest to you that is, you know, is, is there a consensus on a problem and is there a consensus on a solution? And if you see it like I do, you come to the conclusion that we're a pretty long ways away from from legislation in that area. But, you know, there may be, the education is, is important. Um, the, the other thing I would suggest, rather than sort of thinking about legislation, I know we're in Washington, but there is a lot going on in the states. There are, there are uh, wonderful and terrifying experiments going on in, uh, in California, as always, you know, they lead boldly or, or not. Uh, and, and what is happening with respect to renewable penetration? What are the issues coming up with that? Uh, dry, you know, dry statistics coming out of places like FERC on the market summer assessment. Talk about, the, you know, the, the incredible progress on solar and really interesting ways that people are coming up to try and deal with, with that. Uh, you know, California says we're going to mandate storage. Uh, how, how does that, how does that, it doesn't really exist, but we're going to mandate it and they will come. The field of dreams, they've done it before. Maybe, maybe it'll work. I don't know. But that's the holy grail, right? Because if we could come up with that, then all these intermittent renewables would, would become dispatchable, would become controllable, it would be, it would be a breakthrough. So, so we need to think more broadly than sort of what we can do here on Capitol Hill because I think, I don't even think we've really defined the agenda. I mean, I, I, 
mentioned in a sidebar to Charlie, one of the things I've suggested to folks on the Hill is, you know, what, what is the role of SPRO in the era of abundance? Now, that might be an interesting question to think about and think about not only in terms of how we use it and the old laws that governed when it would be used, but is it the right size? I mean, we were going to have a certain import level coverage. I mean, all that's now stale. And I think there is some uh, work in the administration on that. That may be something you could actually get some collaboration on. And, and it's not a trivial thing. The government has invested billions of dollars in that, and it's, it's I think, tens of millions of dollars a year, if I'm not right, if not wrong, Kevin, just to, just to maintain it. So, so I, I'm not averse to sort of starting with the doable, but, you know, in the energy side, doing some things that might make sense if we really think the paradigm has changed. We are going to have to deal with the export issues. I think Lisa Murkowski has been doing some really interesting work on her staff on white papers and, and research with GAO, research with CRS. Uh, that help build some of the information you've talked about. There needs to be more, but I, I think sort of putting some bogey of comprehensive energy legislation out there, it isn't, it isn't the time, it isn't the place, as, as far as I can tell. I, and I think it could distract us from doing things that might be useful, maybe just aren't so grand. All right, since I promised you that this would be participatory, I, we, it's time that we need to open this up. So I'm going to actually... A uh, couple of people I've talked to in advance about uh, calling on them and uh, teasing out some of these topics. And there's four in particular I'd like to hear from, and then we'll open up for uh, questions, general questions and discussions. So, Kevin, I'd like to start with you and talk about the fuel mix and, and 111D. You know, so the, the notion of natural gas being the fuel of choice and moving away from coal, but what does it do to dispatchable uh, renewables? What does it do with nuclear? And then Charlie and Lynn, I want to draw you in there too. I want to then go to Mike Bromwich. Um, we've talked a little bit about offshore. We've done a lot of unconventional onshore. It used to be silly to drill for deep gas offshore right now, and we've got all this resource onshore. But other parts of the world, as we move to the Arctic, technologically complex plays, what's the next step up for, for safety or regulation that we can share internationally? Would be a terrific thing to know. Bob Secuda, total surprise, but I would like to actually talk about the foreign policy consequences of this resource uh, enormity and what we do with it, how we think about it. And then my fourth choice is Lynn Coleman, because my fourth choice is always Lynn Coleman. Um, he can add uh, perspective and insights that, that a lot of us can't even begin to touch. So um, let's start with you, Kevin, and then we'll work our way around. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Frank. Um, the EPA rule is a gripping read. It's 645 pages. I encourage it to anyone who's had trouble sleeping lately. Uh, but one of the, the things that you get out of the technical annexes, which bring you to several hundred other pages, uh, are some of the underlying assumptions that EPA is making. Uh, essentially, a 0.58 percent power demand growth in the base case uh, between now and 2020, which is really the, the cutting year of the rule. And you have to ask, well, so what are they counting? They're already counting a significant reduction in coal-fired capacity as a result of retirements associated with the mercury and air toxics rule. And on top of that, they've got 46 to 49 gigawatts of coal retirements, and uh, yet they're not counting on a lot of new natural gas combined cycle capacity. The, the, uh, the embedded assumption of the rule, explicit assumption of the rule, is that they're going to try to encourage redispatch to existing capacity. Uh, and in fact, some of the least efficient natural gas combined cycle in their numbers uh, retires. Uh, two or three gigawatts disappear. Uh, so while that's great, there is, there is another alternative case, which is that there's a significant amount of natural gas combined cycle built to solve the problem of how you get there. There's also practical questions, uh, pipes and wires uh, to make the power dispatchable, pipes uh, to bring the, the gas to the plants. Uh, those things have a cost. Uh, they, there are above ground impediments to getting them done. Um, but the, rules, the rule is effectively trying to get past the a priori assumption that the solution is to get to gas. They've given you two options, and in the first preferred option, they're asking, you know, hey, let's, let's go ahead and count renewables and energy efficiency as part of the solution. But they have also included a second option. Uh, and, uh, and they've also looked at, at sort of partial building blocks, uh, where instead of all four building blocks, you just look at the energy efficiency uh, gains at a plant that exists today and also natural gas. And that's a very practical way of saying that perhaps what could be going on here is a very big natural gas uh, increment. 
Uh, in their projections, that they're only looking at between 2.3 and 4.9 BCF a day of incremental power sector gas demand between now and 2020 as a result. That means that the upper bound, which represents not doing the third and fourth building block, but just using efficiency at redispatch, you're getting uh, about the same increment that you've gotten from a price effect that's been locked in by the MATS rule, but that's a lot. So, uh, there, you know, part of, the, part of what's happening here is a very big ask for natural gas, when natural gas is at the center of a lot of other policy discussions, LNG, as mentioned before, and for that matter, the environmental questions that come along with producing a hydrocarbon as a bridge. Uh, so uh, EPA has pulled, pulled a, a, a lot of stuff together, but there is a real politic element to this uh, built into the rule, which seems to be saying, yeah, the policy is gas. Yeah, let, let, let me try uh, just to add a little. I agree with everything you've said uh, uh, on this. Um, one of the things that's happened in the last 10 years, 15 years, in the electricity side is, as most know, there's been a uh, significant growth of pooling on a regional basis of generation that's economically dispatched on a megawatt neutral basis that doesn't differentiate any megawatt from the source or megawatt hour from the source. Uh, so there's no um, um, capacity credit given to certain types of capacity. Uh, I agree that both the market itself and then the impetus provided by 111D is driving to a natural gas uh, uh, select, which is both in substitution of coal and jeopardizing our existing nuclear plants within their existing license life. So you're gonna get early retirements out of that. And do we care? Um, I, I would be one who cared about that, but we don't have a policy on uh, or measurement or discussion about the implications of ending up with single fuel dependency in our electricity sector. Uh, and if you look at, I was referred to nuclear as a brittle fuel because it was vulnerable to the next uh, offense of uh, radiological offense or accident as it might occur anywhere in the world and certainly anywhere in the United States. Uh, that would put a lot of political pressure on the continued operation of nuclear plant. And it could take plant offline until defects were corrected, et cetera. I think we also have to think of natural gas as a brittle supply source. If, for example, we had through operator error and bad practice, a major aquifer uh, implicated by shale gas development, uh, the public might di not differentiate the cause. And that could have significant implications at the margin for this fuel select in the future going on. Also, you're starting to see now more and more uh, concern raised uh, recently by a report out of DOE this last week that leakages of, of methane associated with the production of natural gas and its transportation may uh, be contributing to global climate change in a way that basically equates equally with coal production uh, so that you're not getting the global warming benefit uh, that has been predicted or argued for. Now, I actually don't believe that science, uh, but uh, that science is being argued and developed, and that could change our, our discussion here as well. Just a, just a quick, quick follow-up, because I, I think I agree with you, Kevin, and one, and because it does seem to me a very central part of the rule, and I don't, in addition to the wires and pipeline problems, sort of how you, how you just go over a short period, relative short, from, from the capacity utilization that is being produced by the electric markets we have today to a material higher, a materially higher capacity utilization on existing plants. I don't know how you do that. I mean, 
either either the cost of, of alternatives is going to have to be increased, so that ratchets up sort of economic. So you have economic issues. Are we going away from market-based dispatch? We're going to some other kind of dispatch. Uh, if, if the states and maybe they're going to impose fees or something to do that, and then there are just the simple logistical issues. I mean, it may be d d does the gas infrastructure exist to feed it at that level? Does the do the transmission wires exist to transport power from there at that level? Do they have the gas contracts at that level? How is all this supposed to happen? And you know, I've had some conversations with folks, and then and sort of then the second issue, as I said, is just just the compatibility with electric markets as as we've structured them under. Hogan and others on you know locational marginal pricing. So so how how is that? I, I keep talking to people like Sue Tierney. How how, how is this going to fit together? And, and I don't have that figured out yet. So uh, so uh, and was, uh, Kevin, thank you for your comments. They they prompted Charlie to say something that I want to respond to. Uh, <laughs> so so on this sort of natural gas and, and, and nuclear, I, th there's there's two things that I think are important. One. I think nuclear does okay under this rule, especially with a broad fence. That I don't think in a world in which you have some kind of carbon performance standard, that natural gas actually then starts to outcompete nuclear, especially if there's a broad fence where nuclear helps uh, demonstrate your compliance with whatever the final policy this, your state uh, is implementing. Um, this is just a clear sign, of course, of how unbelievably complicated this rule is. And, and, and Kevin is a better soldier than I am to have had to have actually read this uh, uh, report or th this proposal uh, in its entirety. Uh, the second thing I'd like to say uh, in terms of how we think about the, the climate change implications of natural gas, uh, I, I think there are a lot of things we can do to make sure that we minimize the upstream emissions, especially of methane, in the production of natural gas. There's been efforts to try to deal with and promote uh, green completions at oil and gas production facilities. Uh, right now, as a part of the administration's uh, uh, approach to methane, uh, they've had EPA issue a series of white papers um, that are very technical, soliciting uh, uh, feedback from experts, including those in industry, on different ways in which you can further reduce the emissions of methane associated with oil and gas production. So I think there's ways to deal with this. Um, I think there are those who just don't like fossil out there, who are beating up natural gas. Um, there are also some of those who just don't like natural gas because they like coal. And so they're trying to say, look, this isn't really better than coal. And, and, and I think that if you develop the natural gas resource prudently, you're going to deliver significant climate benefits relative to continuing to burn coal. And that's even excluding the potential local public health benefits we have when we burn more coal for power than we, excuse me, when we burn more natural gas for power than we burn uh, for coal. So it, it's certainly an issue that we need to address. I think we're in the process of better understanding the technologies to address uh, the fugitive emissions and the upstream emissions uh, associated with natural gas production. Um, we're understanding what kind of policy instruments um, can, can allow us to, to uh, promote the deployment of those uh, control technologies. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, we should be able to take advantage of this natural gas bounty in a way that delivers important climate benefits relative to the status quo in the energy system. Let, let me just say, Joe, I, I am a very much, it, my comments may not sound like it, but I am very much favor natural gas as the select fuel, and I think that's a good uh, outcome here for the climate and for the economy. Um, I, I think there is, uh, it is true that the rule, if implemented, will create a value added, likely, depending on how the SIPs are written, a uh, value added uh, to the existing nuclear plants. But in the interim, they, are, they run significant deficits on a current dispatch basis. And there may be a need for a capacity charge that uh, is simply to improve their economics to keep them on the system while uh, we are developing this rule and seeing what its outcomes are. One small point on, on nuclear, <clears throat> one of the reasons that some are being so challenged is that uh, uh, wind with a 30 percent uh, uh, tax credit can actually pay uh, to take their dispatch, which nobody can compete with, certainly not nuclear. I mean, that, that clearly needs to be changed. Just uh, by way of uh, clarification, the, the rule does give 
incentives to preserve nuclear capacity by counting nuclear at-risk nuclear generation in the denominator, sort of diluting the fossil intensity of state fleets. Uh, but as you mentioned, the capacity option and other encouragement may be required. Uh, the, re the rule mentions that and says you might consider paying for it because it's a pretty cheap offset between something like 13 and $17 per metric ton if, you, if you're paying six bucks a megawatt hour to keep it alive. All right, I want to switch gears a little bit. So the unconventional revolution, the fact that we are drilling wells now in eight days, eight days, that's an average in certain fields, which is absolutely phenomenal. But they have steep decline rates. So the recovery rate is low and the decline rates are high. Um, when you look at some of the offshore development, uh, typically big fields that we're going after produce for a long period of time. But as we've seen in Macondo, and we had many discussion on that when that was occurring, in the aftermath of that, how do we ensure as we move to technologically complex wells, to the areas like the Arctic, joint development of the Gulf of Mexico with Mexico, um, subsalt in Brazil, to make sure this is done safely? And Mike, you've been doing a lot of work on this. Well, thanks very much, Frank, and Frank, uh, thanks for putting together such a terrific panel, uh, particularly hearing from Bennett and Charlie and Linda reminded me of my early days in D.C. as a young lawyer who was trying to sift through the entitlements program, uh, which was a remnant of the oil and gas controls program where we had itty-bitty refiners sprinkled across the South making millions and millions of dollars hand over fist. It's essentially brokers over pieces of paper that entitled them to refine oil. Um, on the offshore front, um, I think our experience over the last four years and our specific experience with Macondo and Deepwater Horizon really does bring home how many unknowables there are. And getting back to the point Charlie made a, a few minutes ago, uh, how one incident or a couple of incidents can really change the landscape uh, enormously. Following Deepwater Horizon, I think many people, I think people in the administration and outside, thought that that accident uh, constituted an existential threat to offshore drilling and particularly to deep water drilling. I know many people in the industry felt that way. As many of you know, I was a newcomer uh, to regulating offshore development. Uh, but that was the message I got is, my God, we've got to do some dramatic things here to build and restore the public's confidence that this can be done safely. And without any legislative support at all, we did. Uh, we developed safety regulations. We developed enhanced environmental and management regulations. And I think very few people in May and June of 2010, when the oil from the Macondo well was still flowing, would have imagined that in June of 2014, we've got as many or more rigs offshore, deep water, than we did before the spill. So I think that underscores the unknowability of what's going to happen in the future, the potential impact that accidents can have. Because if we'd had another one within a couple of months, the game might have been over. I know people in the industry thought so, uh, and I can't say that they're wrong. I don't think anybody in this room can say that they're wrong. And yet we see the resilience uh, that the industry and the government executive branch of the government demonstrated there. But as Frank suggests, there is sort of a whole new and unknown world that remains out there um, in the Arctic, um, but well beyond the Arctic. I mean, one of the things that I've had the opportunity to see over the last several years is the enormous appetite for offshore activity in parts of the world that I didn't know were interested. I've been to New Zealand. I've been to Colombia. Uh, in January, I went with Senator Graham and Bill Riley and a delegation from the Council on Foreign Relations to Cuba. Uh, there is an enormous appetite for exploration and development offshore in locations um, that, again, I would not have guessed there would be the interest. The interest exists because the revenue uh, is there as a huge lure for undeveloped economies uh, that need to find a way uh, to finance various governmental activities. And so what that does is to present a challenge not just to us, 
but to present a challenge on an international scale. Uh, and one of the encouraging things I saw in the government and that I've seen since is an increased level of collaboration, consultation, learning one country from another uh, in terms of what different regulatory regimes emphasize um, and, and what they're stressing. So I think that's a very encouraging uh, development. Uh, I think it's one that's likely to uh, continue. We're going in this country through an enormous debate on what's going to happen uh, in the Arctic. People have focused on Shell's attempts to drill there and its misadventures a couple of years ago. And I think what people need to keep in mind is it's one Arctic, just as it's one Gulf of Mexico. Um, and whether or not Shell or any other U.S. company um, drills offshore in U.S. waters in the Arctic, there's drilling already going on right now. Russia has begun to drill offshore in the Arctic which simply underscores the need the, to, to make this uh, an international uh, place where we can converge, where we can discuss, where we can learn from one another, and where we can enhance safety, which is a prerequisite to further and better activity. I want to switch to make this a little bit global. So Charlie, number, actually a number of people on the panel have talked about um, the, the balancing and how we've had in the past uh, energy policy been subordinate or at least impacted by and impacts as well uh, economic policy, environmental policy, national security, foreign policy, right? Yesterday when we did our export session, we had Dan Jurgen here and, and we, we had put together a triangle for the and National Petroleum Council study several years ago and we found efficiency to be the sweet spot but everything else was a trade-off and when you're on the government side, you're constantly trading off these policies so while individual complaints about um, a certain policy being suboptimal from an environmental standpoint or suboptimal from an energy standpoint, it's because of these trade-offs. And when you look at the foreign policy implications, and this is what I wanted to bring Bob in on, <clears throat> this notion of energy resource as an asset. So how does it impact our foreign policy considerations? How we look at the world? Has that changed for us vis-a-vis -vis China or all the discussions we heard about Ukraine and Europe? Um, what does that look like now? And so, Bob, if you wouldn't mind taking a shot at that. Sure, Frank, thanks. And this, it's really great to be here with all of you. And it's a, it's, it, is a, it is an outstanding panel and, and kind of fun to sort of see all these people who we read about and heard about, Senator, and so forth, for years. Uh, thank you. Um, and thank you very much for sort of laying the basis for what we're working with today. Because, you know, this, there is this sort of like, this concept, I think, of some of the con some of the things which we talk about, sort of springing forth like Athena from Zeus's head. This was built for a long time, and the question really does become: Okay, how do we use this now? We have, as you, as I think, as we've said before, this idea that for much of my career, um, the careers of many people around this room, and looking at Rich Kozarich and other people around here, um, we dealt with a world of scarcity. We're in a sort of strange situation right now where we both have scarcity and surplus. We have surplus in terms of the United States, in terms of the energy in North America, and the revolution that's going on here. But we also have scarcities in a large number of places in this world. We have scarcities in terms of energy poverty, where you've got 1.3 billion people don't have, a, uh, don't have electricity, connection to the grid, 2.7 billion they don't have a safe way to cook their food. So when you've got that many people out there who don't have something that we have, you've got yourself a foreign policy issue. You've got yourself a national security issue. How do we meet those needs? How do we transfer what we have acquired here in the United States and Canada and other countries to other parts of this world? You've got some cases of countries out there that are very hesitant to take on some of the things that you've done here. The discussions about shale in Europe being a good example there. You've got some places, and they come on the earlier discussion about offshore drilling, where they might take on our technologies, but they might not do it safely. Uh, in, if you have an accident in some place that we may not be thinking about, what are the consequences going to be for shale gas production in the United States or unconventional gas production in the United States? How do we bring that together? Um, there is very much the idea that, as, we, as Frank, you just said, that we were in a situation, many people sort of thought, oh, well, the problems of supply disruptions are in the past. They're not. We've seen that. 
And let's face it, there can still be a problem in the Straits of Hormuz tomorrow. We don't necessarily know what's going to happen. And no matter how much energy we're producing here in the United States, the consequences for us of a supply disruption in the Straits are going to be, are going to be telling, because they're going to hit the global economy, and that's going to hit us. Um, what I'd like to try to, though, get is I think we do see the question of, of opportunities. We see this in terms of engaging countries like China as they deal with the tremendous pollution problem, as they need to move to cleaner sources of energy. How is this something that we can try to move on? How do we move with countries, uh, Burma's, countries like that, that don't have grids right now, but that need power? This is another area of opportunity. So I think one of the things that we need to be looking at here is not just sort of taking this sort of passively or rifle shot or catch as catch can opportunistically, but how do we think more systematically about the foreign policy implications of today's energy world? Um, we are not just being the, the receivers of action in this energy world, but we're also the ones that are creating the opportunities, that are creating things that can be done, whether it's on gas, oil, nuclear, renewables, uh, energy or, or um, uh, uh, energy efficiency. These are things which reach across to our country and frankly reach much deeper, I think, than we sometimes think in terms of, of companies, not just IOCs, but you know who's coming up with the with the software or the or so forth uh, for these soft grids. We're looking right now, working on Power Africa and, and Connect 2022 and things in, in Southeast Asia, where we're trying to work with countries now to integrate their electrical grids. And we see this as an opportunity and a way to sort of build a more peaceful uh, world, a more integrated world. But it isn't just going to kind of happen. We need to be a little more systematic. And we probably also need to have, you know, where are our priorities? Where are these going to kind of come through? And how are we going to shape this? So I think in one sense, as we, as we look ahead for what we're doing in the United States, and as critical as that is, um, we are going to need to keep, in the, not just in the back of our minds, but actually as part of our debate, how can we use this? How can the world use this in terms of building a more stable, prosperous society? Uh, energy doesn't need to be a source of conflict. Well, and one of the interesting things is the dynamism that's gone on. If you never believed or if you always believed in first movers having an advantage, what the United States has done over the last seven years has just been phenomenal. I want to ask to engage Rich Koslerich. Um, when you looked at some of these areas, especially coming out of the Caspian or Central Asia, um, what's the impact there? I, we spent a lot of time on, on pipelines and projects. But the interrelationship and the technology transfer is going to be key in meeting our economic goals, security goals, and environment goals as well. How do you look at this? Uh, thanks a lot, Frank. Uh, I'm not going to put myself in the same expert category that uh, the panelists are in or, or Bob's uh, current experience in this. But, but a couple of observations. I mean, I, I did, when we, we went into the Caspian, as you know, it was from this idea we're in an energy scarcity situation and that these resources are so profoundly important that we have to expend a lot of geopolitical capital to, to make that the case. The, the lesson got across to people, so much so that I don't think people in the region, the Azerbaijanis and the Kazakhs, really understand what's changed in the global energy game and their role, role in it. So part of the education process, I think Bob mentioned, has to be with, with these producers to help them understand what's, what's, gone, what's going on in the global uh, picture that may make their resource as valuable as it might have been in 1994, coming on 20 years now of the signing of the contract of the century, just isn't the same. The second thing is the whole infrastructure situation, the whole pipeline question I think is now uh, really in a, in a different uh, situation than we were in the 90s. It, it is about gas. And it's not so much about gas going west, but gas going east. And I think it's really very important to watch how this Russia-China uh, gas agreement plays out in, in that respect. Um, and the last thing I guess I would throw out as, as a, a wild card that I don't hear discussed very much and that is the potential for Iran re-entering 
the global energy market as a responsible citizen and what the impacts that will have, particularly in this region, on the competitiveness of, of Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, and maybe even Russia. But those are the, the kinds of things I think that, th that I, I sense out of that region where I've, I've paid, the, paid the most attention. One last footnote. I was struck as, as the panelists talked about uh, the U.S. policy environment. It, it seems kind of similar in Europe as well. I mean, here's, uh, you know, they are unable to get a European energy policy for many of the same reasons that, that we've been discussing. And when, when we were dealing with a scarcity in environment, it was, it was easier to get the, the Western countries together because we kind of understood what the issues are. Now I think it's going to be even more difficult um, because of our own lack of ability to lead in the way that we did then. But the Europeans themselves, who still ultimately are going to be our major partners in anything we do, do globally, are, are less, less unified than than we. I just want to pick up on two points that, that both Bob and Rich have raised. I, so going back to the Caspian experience, and, and Mike, you, you talked about this too. When we first got in the Caspian, there were no laws. And I remember the companies initially thought, this is great. There's no laws. We can write with a clean slate. And then after about 48 hours, we realized, oh my god, there's no laws. This is not a good thing. Um, liability, indemnity, environmental performance all had to be embodied in the contract, and the contract got this thing, right? So, it was difficult, but having said that, the companies voluntarily decided that we were going to use best practices in either the Gulf of Mexico or the North Sea because we wanted to be there for 30 years. On the, on the transit routes, I, it, clearly we've learned that gas is different from oil, right? And so some of the experience from BTC were not transferable and ought not have been transferable to Nabucco, for example. Um, LNG is going to play a bigger role globally than we thought it was going to play before because of enormous gas resources. We could get an increased regionalization, so this notion of Iran or Iraq. Um, Bob, you talked about the Strait of Hormuz. In the 1970s, 70% 70 of what came out of the Strait went to Europe and the United States. And now 75% hangs the left and goes to Asia, a markedly different world that we need to be aware of. So even as the dynamism changes and then the relationship between the U.S. and China you can start seeing land routes being developed from the Chinese because they're concerned about the U.S. with a Blue Sea Navy blocking their energy resources, right? So, so they're competing in Africa and Central Asia as well. So it's a totally different world. Bennett, your uh, I'd like to respond to something Bob said, which is a little bit like the crazy uncle in the attic you don't want to talk about. <laughs> and that is uh, the 1.3 billion people who have no access to any electricity and what, 2.7 who can't properly cook. And what do we do about them? And what do we do about climate change if they really want a piece of the economic pie? How do we respond to that? I mean, you know, we don't want to say it can't be done because then that, you know, we can't face the terrible reality of uh, six degrees C increase in climate by the end of the century. I mean, that's pretty hot. But what do we do about those people? I mean, look at the projections of, of you know, International Energy Agency, IEA, everybody's projecting these huge increases. You know, uh, three billion extra people, uh, triple GDP, uh, 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 doubling of the amount of light duty vehicles. Uh, what, how do we deal with those things consistent with climate change? I mean, and what do we do if it, if it doesn't work? I mean, I'm, I'm glad we're doing, trying to do something to show American leadership, but the premise that all we have to do is have American leadership and everybody's going to follow, to me, it doesn't compute. It was, something's missing, and we've got to figure out what it is well, to make it work. It's a little bit worse than that. So the IEA does their projections <laughs> on a 350 or 450 case, right? But we're, we're far off that trajectory. So, so maybe that's a question. So Joe, Kevin, 
Linda, this notion of squaring the circle here on climate change with a fossil fuel future that I think has been prolonged, maybe not perpetuated, but, but because of oil and gas, what does that look like? You want to go first, Kevin? No, go ahead. No, okay. Uh, Are those cap shoes? It's, uh, you know, I, I think it, it is really tough, especially when we look at the growth we expect in the developing world. And, you know, right now we look at, you know, for example, what's happened in China over the past couple of decades. I mean, in one sense, it's an economic miracle to see the hundreds of millions of people who have been lifted out of poverty. We see the emergence of a real middle class there. You know, it's, it's, if anything, you know, there are people in other parts of the world that can aspire to something that we used to call the American dream. And, uh, but of course, part of that is, um, you know, driving cars, being able to power your homes, uh, you know, drawing on energy. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, you know, when we think about the prospects for the very poor, if they are to follow a similar kind of development route, um, you know, th then it, it's hard to imagine any kind of, of world other than the very hot world that the senator just described. So it, it, it is tough. Um, you know, this is one thing where I, I remember when I, when I first started working on this issue and, um, um, you know, we weren't as concerned about the growth in developing countries. In, in, the, in the 1990s, China was actually had pretty modest emissions growth. They had tremendous improvements in efficiency. And then over the course of the next decade, there was a debate on whether or not the statistic is they're building one power plant, coal-fired power plant a week or two coal-fired power plants a week. And, and it starts to sort of raise these questions, and some people talk about it in our domestic debate, which is, you know, what kind of impact is, you know, fuel economy standards or power plant standards going to have in a world in which we see such rapid growth in emissions? And I, and I think for that, there's a couple things that are important. One, if, if we can start to really demonstrate the, um, uh, the commercial viability of, of low carbon and zero carbon technologies for use around the world, that's going to be critically important. So it's, it's, it's the role that we play in innovation. You know, it, it's, it's this thing where it, it's, you know, th th there's perhaps an apocryphal story about how the, the first estimate on the number of computers we needed when there were some initial uh, discussions about contracts uh, with the U.S. government, and there was an estimate we needed 50 computers for the world. 50. There's more than 50 computers in this room right now when we think about our phones, et cetera. Right? And, and, and I think part of that is just the fact that we had such incredible uh, investment in innovation. Uh, we had there, I think, important when we think about in computers and IT, but this is true when we think about agriculture. It's true when we think about uh, medical and, and, and pharma research. Important collaboration between the public and private sector, sort of going both ways and being able to develop the new technologies that really phenomenally improve our quality of life. I think we need that when we think about it in, in the energy sector, if we're going to be able to support the quality of life that you know, we've come to expect in the United States and that other people around the world aspire to. We're going to need that kind of collaboration on the innovation front to have technologies that allow us to do that without seriously jeopardizing the climate. And, and I think that's, you know, to me, the, the, the real frustration when I look at climate policy, it's not just that there's sort of inaction and we're not reducing our emissions today. It's that we're not sending the right kind of signals to the really clever inventor, the really clever entrepreneur who works with the inventor and actually brings something from the lab bench or the garage actually to the marketplace, um, that we don't actually see the kind of, of, of thoughtful investments in the public sector to provide that kind of knowledge foundation for what could be game-changing technologies in, in, in the future. It's, it's, it's difficult to imagine, given the current investments in the energy sector around the world, the needs for energy when we think about a growing, uh, developing world, um, and the current stock of technologies we have on the shelf that we can actually achieve our economic development and climate change goals uh, without, I think, some change in, in policy. But it can't, as a policy matter, it can't be either or. It's got to be both, right? So the, the notion that um, how you get there, and maybe that maybe the narrative needs to be changed, too. It, we talk less about mitigation, more about uh, resiliency and adaptation. So we're, we're getting around to it, but we're trying to embrace... Oh, oh I, I mean, I, I think... Yeah, th there's a number of ways we can deal with climate change risk. There's, there's been perhaps too much focus, certainly in the, in the 90s, uh, but even still today, on trying to stop the problem from happening, and that's reducing our emissions. Okay? The problem is happening. Um, it's, going to, it's going to get worse than it is today. Um, there's just too much already baked into the system. And so the second is, well, how do I adjust to climate change? How do I adapt? And so there's discussions about adaptation and thinking about how we can use better uh, um, um, uh, data and information to inform the way we plan and, and make ourselves more resilient to shocks associated with the changing climate. 
And I think that's important. And I think, to be honest, because I'm not optimistic about our ability to really limit uh, emissions, at some point we're going to have to have a discussion about geoengineering. Um, this idea that we're going to use technologies to try to somehow limit the amount of incoming solar radiation. Uh, th th there's just, I think, more and more um, research is going on this front. There's more and more research actually in the social sciences to think about the, the governance um, and the incentives for the use of these kinds of technologies. We've seen some sort of nascent research, um, uh, even supported by various uh, governments around the world uh, along these lines. Um, but it's the kind of thing which has just been like, off of the table when it comes to international climate negotiations. Um, and, and, and domestically, there's been very little appetite to try to address this. Um, but at some point, if the planet gets too warm, I think we're going to see, whether it's the US, whether it's some other country, whether it's a non-state actor decides to actually implement some kind of geoengineering uh, intervention. And I think uh, we're going to need to think about how we can effectively um, push on all these margins. How do we mitigate the emissions and keep the problem from happening, or at least happening as bad as it could be? How do we adapt and become more resilient to the changes that will occur? And then think about as, as sort of an insurance policy whether or not we have a means to sort of fix uh, the problem um, and bias more time for investments in adaptation and mitigation uh, through geoengineering. Let me respond to first say I, I strongly, strongly endorse those goals, but uh, I have a little experience here uh, to talk about um, energy <clears throat> innovation <clears throat> uh, like Moore's Law with computers I don't think quite works. I, I was uh, chairman of the Energy and Water Appropriations Committee or a, 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 either chairman or ranking for 20 years, and we did all the R&D. And instead of having a Moore's Law, I can tell you the immutable law was in energy policy, energy innovation, first, it's going to cost more, and secondly, it's going to take longer. I mean, the rather than being like computers, it's more like cellulosic ethanol. You know, <laughs> cellulosic ethanol was supposed to, was supposed to just find some magic somewhere that was gonna, it was gonna make it work, and it hadn't really worked yet. I hope it does. Hope it does, and we, and we have to keep trying. So I endorse the goals, but you know, wishing doesn't make it so. Senator, we talk about that being it's just around the corner, but it's a really long block. Yeah. Uh, um, so, so I think I think I would associate myself um, more closely with Joe's thoughts on this. I mean, as I look at this, you know, it's kind of a it's a it comes in two buckets. On the first side, you have um, the U.S. process whereby we are um, identifying our global interests relative to um, uh, to the energy world, and and we are articulating those right. So and socializing those so everyone at home understands what our national goals are um, and, and all of our trading partners around the world understand what those are. Uh, with that, I think, goes a recognition um, on our part of understanding, you know, we need to recognize the limits of what we can appreciably do, right? So let's look at the EPA's proposed carbon rule. What do we think is going to happen to this displaced coal over the next several decades? Is it going to simply go away? or is it going to be moved overseas, right? That's got to be a part of the discussion. Um, I think the second part of that is, um, and particularly, Joe, to your point, is to focus on innovation as a means of achieving these goals. So, um, so let's just say, let's take, for example, energy exports. Do we really believe that uh, exporting energy to Europe, either in the form of LNG or oil, is going to solve Europe's economic woes, right? exports, importing these, pro importing oil, importing natural gas did not make the United States the, the energy powerhouse that it is today. It was our innovation, you know, put into the ground, applied um, in extraction processes and put to use that is, that is the reason for this boon that we have today. I think the same could be true for uh, Japan, right? They're in, they're in a situation they are largely because of the policy decisions that they're making today. So, so focusing on innovation as one of the keys to meeting our national goals, international goals, national security um, in particular. Um, and, then, and then probably a bit of a restatement, but, but understanding that the world needs us to be 
the leader in this capacity because if we're not, no one else will or somebody else will and that's probably not something that we want to really envision um, in the near term. And so that means that we need to be thoughtful about the steps that we take and, and it means, frankly, that we need to recognize part of our national interest is protecting our national interest as a global leader economically. Um, and so I think that um, to the extent that we recognize those and focus, you know, first on what we think is going to be best in the long term uh, for the United States and by extension the world and looking in that capacity, I think we have a better, um, we have a better outcome globally um, in terms of national security, regional conflicts, and the like. Lynn Coleman, it's time for you to impart your wisdom, and then we'll open it up to general questions. I'm an old natural gas lawyer. I started off in Houston, Texas, sitting in great big rooms of lawyers, all of whom are representing producers in something called the South Louisiana area rate case, which uh, we were debating whether the price of natural gas ought to be 18 cents or 20 cents. And the Federal Power Commission, in its wisdom, said 20 was plenty enough. And the uh, the consumer groups, the state commissions in the North and East took that case to the Supreme Court saying it was an outrage. And uh, you all talked about the things that happened in the next 10 years when we went from area regulation to national regulation to uh, quasi-regulation of the, the Policy Act and then ultimately to uh, deregulation. Those fights were as hard as any I can imagine or have observed in my time in Washington, but they were by and large not partisan. They tended to be regional, and um, being regional, it generally got down to being an issue over money. When it gets to be an issue over money, you can generally find a way to compromise it. It's much easier than an issue over philosophy, which that's what partisanship is to my way of thinking right now. And I, I don't know how you get any kind of a comprehensive bill the way people look at things right now. I just don't believe that all those highly intelligent Republicans five to ten years ago who were saying, yes, climate change is a problem, the science is real, and we need to do something. I, I doubt they really changed their mind about the science. But they've damn sure changed their mind about what could be done about it. Uh, and uh, the last several years, I mean, a few years ago, I taught seminars on climate change policy, but I posted both from a regular, I mean, energy and an environmental law standpoint. All of the, that always has seemed to me has been two sides of the same coin, really all the same subject. And uh, I think we're hugely blessed or lucky, one or the other, uh, with. Uh, our ability to develop shale gas and uh, shale oil. But the, what we were saying two or three years ago about, well, natural gas is so great, it's so important, and it's environmentally uh, sensitive, and it's going to be the, the bridge fuel until we get to a non-fossil fuel world, that seems to have dropped out of the rhetoric. It looks to me like where we are right now, we could wind up with a stronger fossil fuel world for like the next 100, 200 years. And uh, the climate problem is not going away, <laughs> nor is our inability to solve it go away either, it looks like. I find myself thinking more and more about what another old colleague of ours is saying, Phil Sharp, is it really ought to focus on the carbon. We need uh, to place a, a, a cost on carbon. And I agree with you that uh, most of these cancellations of coal plants have been over economic factors. But part of that economic factor is an anticipation in boardrooms that one way, someday, one day, one way or another, we're going to place a cost on carbon. And it's not wise to keep building coal-fired power plants least in this country, that if you've got plenty of cheap natural gas, that is obviously the way to go. I can't see, but what that's not going to have, however, an adverse impact on our ability to move to renewable 
or to uh, nuclear. So I think we got still lots of problems. Some sound very much like they did 40 years ago. Um, but our, our ability politically to deal with it is sadly going way downhill. <laughs> Let me open it to general questions. Um, uh, we have just a couple of quick rules, and Charlie gets the first question. But the, if you could identify yourself and your affiliation, then um, usually we ask that you dispense from the commentary and go to the question. But in this case, I, if you got commentary, I'd like to hear that too. So, Charlie. Uh, Charlie Abinger from Brookings. I was the other day reviewing Professor Sokolow's famous wedge theory of what we had to do to deal with climate change by 2050 and was immediately struck that two of his major cornerstones and his thinking that we could not get there without these cornerstones were one, the massive diffusion of CCS technology and the massive diffusion of nuclear technology. Now, we all know the problems that both those technologies have encountered in the US, but I would ask the following question. Does, the, does anyone on the panel believe we can solve the kinds of problems Senator Johnson talked about with the uh, meeting the energy needs of the world, and Joe referred to it, without CCS and nuclear? And if that is the case, even though they're expensive, wouldn't we rather be talking about setting a goal to prove that CCS technology is both commercially and technically feasible and finding a way to do that, say, over the next decade, leading the world then by exporting that technology, similarly proving that both technically and commercially small-scale modular nuclear reactors are viable and take a major role in a future export industry for the United States, rather than sitting back and talking about putting a price on carbon put the money in the R&D to prove both these things can be done. Well, I'll step up and, uh, Charlie, well respect for you, but I disagree, I disagree on, on your assumptions. Um, I, uh, I'm with companies that have worked hard on, on CCS. I've w worked with companies that have the biggest coal utility, one of the biggest coal utilities in this country has put a lot of money and effort into it. And uh, after, after thinking about it and working on it for a number of years, I don't see how we're going to get there. Uh, it is, if, if you look at the whole cycle, capture, transport, storage, security, I don't need to remind people in this room about how well we've done with Yucca Mountain of putting something underground and saying it's going to stay there forever and, and monitoring it. And, and as I've traveled the world, if anything, there's more sensitivity about, about storing carbon dioxide underground and the risks of that. And I, I just, you know, technical liability. Uh, nuclear, you know, I, I am, I am I'm fine with nuclear, except that it, it is so, we demand such perfection. And perhaps that is, that is required of that technology, that it is difficult for me to see how we deploy that in ways that are useful in those parts of the world that don't, don't have power. Uh, and if so, the best shot is going to be probably to do something like Phil Sharp talked about and put a price on carbon and let the markets work out what makes the most sense. For me, and the, the reason I'm not quite as, I mean, I agree with the thrust of Joe's point. I agree that technology and innovation is the answer. I'm actually pretty excited about solar at this point, which all my fossil friends would be surprised at because I haven't been for years. And, and it, is, it is part of what I think Kevin mentioned earlier, based on, on what we're seeing in California, what I'm seeing in Japan, and as I go around the world, distributed solar, rooftop solar, the technology on that is advancing at an unbelievable rate. Senator, it's, it's, it's not approaching maybe the, the, the computer law yet, but the costs are coming down, they're achieving the economies of scale, they've developed the business models, and in those places where you don't have a grid, where it can be more competitive, and, and given, you know, continuing technological advances, uh, I think that could play a big role. I don't think there's any magic bullets out there. That's one of the things maybe I've learned over my career. Every time somebody says, this is going to be the answer, uh, you know, keep your hand on your wallet, because it's probably not. But, but I, think, I think that, plus storage, plus more innovation, for me, is a more likely path than, than for us to sit here and say, nuclear and, and CCS are the answer, and that's what we ought to put the money on. Uh, Charlie, I, I, I certainly think we ought to pursue CCS 
I, I think there's been a lot of work done over a period of uh, two or three decades on, uh, on CCS and uh, successfully, but never on a huge scale. And what you really need to do, what the country really needs to do in my judgment, is have uh, three or four commercial scale demonstration projects. Uh, and they, you know, they would be fairly expensive, but you could then demonstrate that you can keep it there and, and, and do it, uh, as I say, on commercial scale. Now, that won't be easy to do, to get the money to do it, to get the places to do it. I mean, you need to do it in several, you know, saline aquifers and uh, other kind of aquifers, et cetera. But until you do that, you really can't make the argument that, uh, that we ought to pursue it because it has not been demonstrated. And we ought to do that. Uh, but, it's, but even getting the, the political will uh, to demonstrate uh, is going to be very difficult. So I, I agree with Linda of let's let the market figure this out in terms of let's put a price on carbon and if there's better, uh, lower cost technologies that abate emissions, let the market pursue them and complement that with what would be a thoughtful R&D strategy. And, and part of that certainly could be focused in, on CCS. Uh, I, the, the thing that makes me reluctant to be that enthusiastic about CCS is that um, doing CCS with a new power plant is really hard and expensive. But I think actually, if we think about this globally, what we need is to be able to have retro um, uh, CCS on the existing coal plants, especially in the developing world, and that's really hard. To really do that uh, where you could efficiently capture the CO2 and stick it underground, that is really expensive. And, and when you look at the kind of R&D we've been doing in the US and, and in other parts of the developed world, it's for the most part thinking about new coal-fired power plot, uh, projects or fossil projects and how you'd integrate CCS in the design of those which is important if we're going to build new power plants, but I think about all those plants in, in China and India and, and how you actually think you're going to retrofit existing facilities, I think is really, really tough. And if CCS is going to be part of the answer, I actually think that's where you have a bigger payoff. But I don't, you know, we're not just talking about like, do we have the political will to put more investment into this? We're talking about some fundamental technical challenges. Um, and there's this question about whether or not we can ever really um, advance those in a way to bring this technology on in an economic way relative to, say, investments that could dramatically bring down further the cost of, say, other zero carbon technologies, whether it's um, small scale nuclear or, or renewables. One additional quick point, um, you can actually do CCS with enhanced oil recovery. In fact, uh, w my son and I are working on a plant down Lake Charles right now to do that. I hope it uh, I hope we go to commercial close within the next few weeks. Maybe we won't, maybe the numbers won't work, but I think it can work. Yeah, I, I, um, I think I would just uh, summarize it to say, let the market drive the R&D. Uh, and there is a place for CCS, but as we look uh, broadly against the suite of technolo uh, technology options, we think that uh, solar is one of the, it, we've heard it before, now we think it's real, that it's uh, the next disruptive technology. Uh, and, and we put billions into R&D, uh, several billions, and we focus heavily on uh, that side, and we know some other very significant players are doing the same. Um, and I think it's safe to say we would look at that much more intently than we look at uh, CCS. We think that um, we need to break out of the current paradigm we have right now and think about what a distributed energy model looks like in um, in the other regions of the world, and while in, in some ways it may be harder to institute here in the United States, and um, and absent some, as Linda said, absent some real breakthroughs on the storage side, there will all, all, always be limitations. But in the underdeveloped world, in particular, uh, if if we start to see in a manufacturing process the kinds of efficiency gains that we expect, the doubling that we see in efficiencies in a year to 18 month time frame. That's happening now. Once we start to see that become practical uh, applications on rooftops, um, I know we see it now. What I'm suggesting is it will be much more, um, much more cost effective uh, and drive much more power into, uh, into distributed markets, micro markets, you know, you know, residences and the like. Um, that that's going to be a big game changer. And that, that's not necessarily saying that's the only one. We could see others out there, you know, you 
I'm sure there are scenarios where we see some advances in, in wind generation uh, efficiency and the like, but we would just kind of, we would prefer to not fixate on one or two big winners here um, and, uh, and instead let the market push the research where it'll go. Yeah, and historic technology will also be a big component in terms of the variability of, of yeah, renewables. Right. Yeah, once we get the breakthroughs in that, yeah. then everything else. And we looked at, at natural gas it, it's, instead of a bridge, it's just, it's, so we look at it as the breathing space to figure out how do we get to the next point, so we look at it as a, as a, a boon there. Other questions? Can I just add a question? Sure. Uh, a slight uh, uh, point, perhaps, but um, I really liked uh, Joe's uh, three-point uh, coping strategy on uh, uh, global warming. And what uh, if we take Lynn's observation that we may be, uh, by reason of this extraordinary, unexpected source of new fossil uh, fuel uh, production capability in shale, um, extending the fossil fuel use uh, and uh, both in time and amount, then uh, you got a serious problem uh, on your hands uh, that before we start modifying the climate, uh, I would certainly want to have been exhausting uh, all research and development options that uh, we might uh, for those who have a technology faith, as I do, uh, then uh, I believe we should have as robust a government R&D program that we should be investing in. And if we can incent further investment in the private sector through pricing carbon, fine. But, you know, the Department of Energy has the largest physical science enterprise in the world. And if we uh, can't engage that enterprise more effectively in addressing this problem, then shame on us. And we are not investing in it to the extent that this problem suggests we should. Hi, um, excuse me, I'm Arbra Johnson with Itochu. Simple question, I don't know if the answer is simple, but I'd like each of the panelists take on uh, if and when the crude oil export ban will be lifted. Let me offer two comments on it. I, I think there were, if I understand it, there are six studies underway. Uh, all designed to show that you could safely and sensibly do this. My view is the studies are going to unnecessarily complicate the issue rather than improve understanding um, because they're trying to say too much. Uh, the, uh, and if we get it entangled in other issues, you'll make it too politically hard for the Congress. I think it's really a simple question. The prohibition on exports of oil are vestigial to a circumstance in market and regulation that no longer exist. And as a matter of principle, uh, the United States stands for open markets. And, and I don't understand, if you will, what the opposition might be to the export if you can, in fact, demonstrate, as the Ergen study did yesterday, that, uh, that it's an unlikely to have an upward movement on price in gasoline, which is politically dynamite if it were to have that. So I think that's the only issue. Is it going to, what's its effect going to be on gasoline markets in the United States? Let's act on principle and get rid of these vestigial things. If you make the 
issue too complicated about uh, refinery capacity and investment and in the Gulf and whether it's going to wait three years for the heavy crude to come in off the offshore and therefore they won't make the investment to handle the sweet oils and it's going to back up the infrastructure and create uh, gridlock or that was the phrase of yesterday, gridlock. Um, I think all that can happen uh, and certainly will happen if the Congress dithers on this thing. So I try to pose the question as simply and as straightforward to the Congress uh, and uh, not confuse them with a lot of information, which I think we're doing. I say it happens in the next Congress. Uh, Frank, I just, Dan was here yesterday, but in his book, he makes the point that during World War II, the United States supplied 85% of the oil of the, all the allies, including their domestic as well as their military requirements. So we've done it before. Most of that came out of Texas. I think it's entirely, um, I think it's entirely gonna be driven by politics. I think if the Republicans take the Senate, then there's a decent chance that they're able to reach some kind of compromise with the administration in the last two years. I think notwithstanding what happens in the Senate, if a Republican wins in 2016, it'll be lifted in the first year or two. It's an action that the Department of Commerce can take. And I think if a Democrat wins in 2016, then, and then it's debatable uh, whether it'll take place in those next two years. So I'm more optimistic. I'll say yes and soon. I should give the caveat. I've been saying the same thing about Keystone for years. Um, but but um, I, I, I think it's, it's um, th there, there's a little bit of the, the politics, as, as Kevin was alluding to, that's a little complicated on, on, uh, uh, on the president's side. But I, I think it's something which makes sense. I think it's consistent with, I think, a general approach to trade policy. I mean, it's a little hard from a diplomatic standpoint to like go around occasionally to countries that produce oil and say we'd like you to produce more oil. Absolutely. And now that we're a producer, we're saying, well, we're gonna produce more and, and we're not going to let anybody enjoy it. Uh, so I, I, I guess I'm a little bit more optimistic that it can happen um, here in, in, in the near term um, before we get to the 2016 fund. Well, and, okay, and having sat through this yesterday, I actually think that, that if, if a properly thought and worded application were to be submitted before the Commerce Department, um, under existing law, you could actually get an export. If we wait for a broad scale, it's gonna take legislation to do that or a national interest finding. I don't think we're there, certainly not between now and November, right? Um, we know this problem is coming, whether it's uh, gridlock or bottleneck or whatever, we're gonna have a different kind of widget than we need. We're gonna have a lot more light oil when we probably want something else. And I actually do think optimization and inputs and, uh, inputs and outputs of refinery makes a difference. Um, if, if we get a different Congress, we'll get a legislative action. But I think you can see relief actually earlier than that. I'm hopeful at least. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Thomas Lamro. I'm a student at Georgetown University. Piggybagging on that previous question, do you think in the near to medium term, the US could become a swing producer and what will the, the foreign policy effects, especially uh, considering uh, the amount of defense spending in the Middle East in order to secure supplies internationally? So, just, so I think oil is different from gas, just to kind of kick this off, right? And we will be exporting gas within the next year and a half, no question. Uh, on the oil side, we're still import dependent, and we will continue to be import dependent, maybe for a different kind of crude. Uh, one of the, the figures that was thrown out yesterday is that we export four million barrels a day of refined product, which is true. Our net exports are a million and a half, which means we're importing three to meet our needs. So you have to keep this in context. So the United States can surpass Saudi Arabia. We're at about 11 now in total liquids if you add biofuels and refinery gain. That's huge, but our demand is 19 million barrels a day. So you have to keep that in context too. So if efficiency comes down, or efficiency improves, and demand comes down, and we get a high resource case that we move up, 
we can close that gap, but I still think we're looking at a net three of import dependence. So what we can supply to the world is incremental production. In the last two years, it's the biggest increase that the world has seen in a long, long time. And short of Saudi Arabia, I think it's number five or six when you add oil to the market. But it's two million barrels a day in a 92 million barrel a day market. Right? So you have to keep that in context too. And Paul's sitting right next to you, but the Canadian um, impact on this market can also be huge. They have 177 billion barrels of oil, which at $100 in a barrel is exponentially larger than their GDP. That's going to move too. It's just a matter of time and the, the gridlock or bottlenecks that we talk about on infrastructure I have just, to occur at some point. Can I just add one, one point uh, to that? I agree, I agree with all of that. Is, um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by swing producer, but, but as I said at the outset, changes are already happening because of, because of what, so, so light, sweet crude oil from Nigeria that used to come to the U.S. is now going, even, is now going somewhere else. And, and by the way, that's a country I'm very, very worried about. And the things that are going on there, some, some of which are, but I mean, just because we have this doesn't mean there can't be upsets. And that, that's one that worries me. But, but already, and, and the, as, as we talked earlier, the flows are moving to the east instead of the west. And that, that sort of, you have to think about it as this, you know, as this giant swimming pool. We're putting in at this end, the water's moving to this end. That has consequences. And there are, there are better people in the room than I am to talk about sort of the political and foreign affairs issues associated with that. But it's not like, okay, we're going to get to zero net import and then all of a sudden there'll be an effect on the market. There are already significant effects on the markets that, that people are having to rewrap. People are finding maybe even a softening of price or where they were getting a premium for certain sweet crudes. Now they're getting a lot less. Uh, and that's having an effect on their income, and that has trickle-down effects on their populations. And, and so it's, it's, it's sort of a continuum rather than a, than a switch in time where we'll, we'll be, I mean, that's what I said, it's changing everything in ways that we're still trying to figure out and that are still, frankly, manifesting themselves out in the marketplace. Hi, my name is uh, Daniel Newman. I'm a law student and a summer law clerk at the EPA. Now, we've been talking a lot about how natural gas is quite obviously going to be a major piece of this country's energy future. And if we're going to put uh, a pro and cons column to this resource, obviously there are a lot of pros. And by my count, there seem to be three major cons. Uh, the first is the methane question, which you guys briefly uh, uh, looked at. The second is the water quality issue, which I believe Charlie uh, briefly talked about. And the third, which is my question, is what about water quantity? Uh, how do you, well, what are your thoughts on, especially in this increasingly dynamic climate where water scarcity is, going, is already increasing? They just look at Phoenix and other parts of the American Southwest. How is uh, water scarcity going to play into this equation? From a technology standpoint, We've actually seen the industry move to lower volumes of water per frack, substitution, and new alternatives as frack carriers. And I would point to the fact that we have a G at this side of the room. We have Bob Walker sitting right next to you from Chevron. The amount that the companies are doing at this point, technologically speaking, is terrific. Seismicity is another concern, but that's mostly been tied to re-injecting of wastewater. At some point, if you, if you segregate, treat, recycle, you still have to dispose, but you can reduce the amount. And as we deal with climate change, I, uh, we had thought that Don Paul, um, Don Paul is at USC, he was a chief technology officer at Chevron. When he talks about geoengineering or things that have to be done to address climate change, if you look out the next 25 years, uh, East Coast gets a lot of rain, arid southwest, we may have to think about things like embarking on building water pipelines, right? And moving this stuff around, just like we may be looking at moving people off the coast. We just haven't got to that point of that discussion yet. But there are major changes coming, but there's still ways of addressing it. When we looked at um, the issue of, uh, especially on the gas side, all the risks that we saw were manageable. And I think, um, Charlie, your study came out with the same conclusion. It's just, it's technological, it's increased cost. Methane emissions are already changing, right? And you can capture them, but you need to do a better job. So you can do it cleaner, smarter, safer. But I, I think that's the easy answer. Uh, 
let me just say this. So one of the, the issues about trying this experiment was, um, and I just got the signal, that breaking down this room for the next session takes a lot more work. So we're gonna conclude this a bit early. But I thought, and this might be useful, so occasionally at CSIS, we actually have senior staff that, that sits down and figures out how we try to do things better. So we had one of those sessions a couple of weeks ago, and when we walked into the room, this is what was on, on the board. So any idea what this is? That's how I felt going in, folks. So D is data. So data minus noise is information, all right? Information plus understanding is knowledge. And the bottom, which I think we've seen here in perspective and context, is that knowledge over time is wisdom. <laughs> and I would argue that the panel that has been assembled today has given you more than a bit of that. It's given us certainly um, new ideas for things we need to study in think tank land. And I would hope we can do this again, because I found this extremely rewarding. And if you find it useful too, uh, we'll be certainly glad to invite you back. But if you'll join me in thanking the panel, and thank you all for your attention. <laughs> She's been outstanding.